You are listening to Flop Culture, a podcast all about flops. I'm your host, Fanula. Hope you're well. Thank you so, 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 so much to everyone who came to Top of the Flops 2023 live upstairs in Wheelands. I can't remember I said this on last week's episode because I pre-recorded it ahead of the show. What a night. It was so much fun. I can't believe people came out. Enjoy the paddles if you took them home. I hope you did. Um, and it was great. Let's do it again next year. Maybe we'll go, we'll go bigger, go bigger, go home. Isn't that what they say, girls? Uh, big thanks to my guests as well, Carla Kay, Patrick Wilson McCarthy, and of course, Owen Keane for joining me on the night. Patrons will get to listen to some of that live recording, but it's on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash flop culture. And speaking of Patreon this month, here's what we're going to be talking about. Carla is joining me once again to talk about the Kardashian Christmas card with a K, why they don't do them anymore, the cultural impact of them. And there'll be a video as well, because obviously it's a visual medium. We're going to be looking, reviewing at that moment in time of celebrity culture and Kardashian culture at large, I suppose. Owen will be back, of course, to watch another episode of Fleabag with me. So we're up to season two, episode two. So watch that be prepared. And then also past guest Kane Sullivan is joining me to discuss contemporary Christmas music, specifically in the pop genre. So like what we think is a bop, what we think is a flop. We're thinking everything Mariah did past All I Want for Christmas is You, newer releases like Sabrina Carpenter's Fruitcake EP, Ariana Grande's Christmas and Chill, you know, Leona Lewis's Christmas efforts. Kelly Clarkson's Christmas efforts. We're going to be looking at who's been successful, who we think will become the Mariah for next generation. Now, don't get me wrong. Mariah's here forever. You only need to look at Brenda Lee, who's just gone to number one very recently with Rocking Around the Christmas Tree in the States. First ever time being number one for that song and took the longest time to get there from first being released and... All that jazz, longest climb, amazing. Look up the Brenda Lee story if you're not familiar with it. It's very good. But Kian has a particular hot take about who could be or what could be the next All I Want for Christmas is You for the next generation. So we're going to talk about all of that on the Patreon. It's patreon.com forward slash flap culture. You get at least, at least two episodes a month. Um, so have a few other plans in terms of other episodes, but nothing concrete yet. That's what you're definitely getting anyway this Christmas. Christmas treats. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Anyway, we're also on social media. Flap culture underscore pod. And if you would like to, and I'd really like you to do this, if you could leave a five-star review wherever you are listening, it helps people find the podcast. If you leave a five-star review on Apple and your nickname, I will recommend a personalised bopper flop to you at the end of next week's episode. So if you want that shout out, hit me up. You know what to do. There's so much news. I could have talked about 800 things, but here is what I have decided to talk about this week. Tree Payne versus De Moi. We spoke about De Moi last week and how the book Anon Plus is being turned into a TV show and who's buying that TV show and that kind of being an interesting concept. And then literally, as I downed my mic, De Moi herself got into some controversy with potentially the second most powerful person in the world, Tree Payne. Tree Payne, Taylor Swift's publicist. What happened, if you're unfamiliar? So as I mentioned again, if you're really not familiar with Dumois, Dumois is in the business of posting and sharing celebrity gossip and celebrity blind items. But she also receives, like, fa- fan submissions is the wrong word, but she see- receives submissions from the public, right? And she had received one about Taylor Swift and that was kind of having a go at Demois herself about the fact that, sorry, further context, with the Spotify wrapped and Taylor Swift being Spotify's top artist for the year, to celebrate that, she released a song to streaming called You're Losing Me, which fans speculate is about her breakup with Joe Alwyn. Her longtime producer, Jack Antonoff, then got involved in the conversation, sharing this picture of when they recorded it and dated it as 2021. They, herself and Joe, obviously didn't break up until the start of 2023. So now people are going mad about the timelines and when they actually broke up, blah, blah, blah. So it prompted this person to write to Demois and be like, you are constantly, you know, basically giving out about people speculating about the timelines and also giving out about Demois 
pushing these rumours that Taylor Swift and Joe Alwyn at one point were married, got married, had some kind of marriage ceremony that wasn't legally binding. That was always Dumois' position and Dumois kind of doubled down on this after this submission, basically saying, I will die on this hill. I'm actually directly quoting her, saying she would, she would die on this hill that there was, there was some kind of non-legal marriage, essentially, right? Which kind of leads me to, me to believe she was shown something. She was definitely shown, shown something. Two hard words to say together. And just vehemently believes or was told that it, that it was something that maybe it wasn't. I don't know. Anyway, she's on the Instagram stories basically saying this. I will die on this hill. There was some kind of ceremony. Some kind of, th- like, I don't know, a promise ceremony. I don't know how you can have a ceremony that's on a marriage. Anyway, Tree Payne, who never, never is not the right word, rarely posts public statements to social media because I don't know half the time she doesn't need to she's Taylor Swift is currently the biggest she's ever been only getting bigger beloved by many hasn't really hit any patches of controversy anything she shares online is usually a repost basically being like Taylor Swift class records broken blah 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 the last time she posted online was during the Kanye West Kim Kardashian feud which kind of ended the start of 2020 around the time that the unedited uh, video of Famous, the Kanye West song, was leaked or released in some way and Tree had to come out and make a statement about that. Has not posted anything since then, right? Tree saw this Dumois post and was like, nah, babe, we're getting to the keyboard. Now, I don't know if it was Taylor telling her to be like, you need to come out and say something against Dumois or Tree just taking it into her own hands. A part of me thinks that they're like, even though Trey Payne's worked with Taylor Swift so long and probably knows her so well in terms of like working together and what to speak out on and what not to speak out on, a part of me wonders would, like, could you actually get away with not speaking to her about coming out on something? I'm not sure. But anyway, someone made the call and Trey Payne then took to her own social media to be like, direct quote, there was never a marriage or ceremony of any kind. This is an insane thing to post. It's time for you to be held accountable for the pain and trauma you cause with posts like this. Which, pretty damning statement, I will say. Now, there has also been some speculation that I think, and because it's all Instagram stories, they're all expired now, so there's kind of no way to independently verify this, right? But some fans are speculating that the statement actually wasn't about the marriage post as much as it was about there'd been a previous story that Dumois had posted speculating around the content of another song bigger than the whole sky and about that being about a miscarriage that Taylor Swift suffered while with Joe Alban which I'm like no Dumois let's I mean there's I just think there's lines you don't cross and I think that's one of them, because it's just, whatever the celebrities come out and spoken about it themselves, weird. Weird, weird, weird. So there's speculation that that's what actually caused the hurt and what the, the bruise that was pressed. And Tree used the marriage thing to point the attention at that as opposed to the miscarriage so as not to draw more attention to that. If that makes sense, I'm not really sure. To moi, not being funny, instead of literally cowering in the shadows, responded to Payne and said, quote, well, I make zero dollars from lying. Can publicists say the same? Also, to relate something that is in reference to something that happened years ago to pain and trauma after what just happened seems like a poor choice of words. Again, people are speculating that Dumois is referring to the death of a fan at a recent concert in South America, which I think, oh, Jesus Christ, then goes on to finish saying, either way, I apologize to Taylor, which I'm kind of like, how much are you doubling down? You know what I mean? Like either stick to your word or don't, you know? I don't know. I'd seen that they turned comments off on a lot of their recent posts and seemed to have something up about John Mayer recently. I don't know, again, to try and maybe claw back some, what you call it, like curry some favor back again with the Swifties. I'm going to check again if they've turned comments back on. I don't think so. And the only people commenting are um, like literally 
Paris Hilton, which I mean, not great. So sorry, comments aren't turned off, but they are limited, right? So if they're limited, it's only people that follow you or you follow them can comment. I think you can, depends on the, depends on your settings. But they have a recent post up about Taylor Swift being at a Chiefs game and it's like a behind the scenes photo, whatever. And you have someone posting, someone commenting under rather, I should say, girl, you bold for posting this right now. Honestly, honestly. Who is Dumois? Something we didn't get into last week. Um, Literally, just like, so there's an air. Well, I, sorry, I will say this is alleged. This is an alleged identity. Cannot confirm. But there has been some research into who the person running the anonymous account is. And there was an investigation by someone. I think his name is Brian Feldman. I think that inve- investigation alleges that Dumois was initially set up as a fashion blog in 2013 by two people, but is now run allegedly only by one person, and that person's name is Melissa Lavallo. Previously ran it with a friend. The friend doesn't seem to be involved right now. So yeah, there you go. Literally just some random around the internet writing things. Mad world. Tree pain. My God, imagine getting an interview with Tree Pain or just any celebrity publicity is a fascinating game. I think I'd love to speak to a publicist for Patreon, but I'm not sure who I could get my hands on. Probably not Tree Pain. She's been working with. I think she worked with Taylor prior to 1989, but she went out on her own with her own firm around the time of 1989 and has worked with Taylor ever since. The secrets she knows, the bodies she's buried. Obsessed. Barbenheimer almost didn't happen because of an Oppenheimer producer. We learned this this week as we watched Variety's Actors on Actors series. New series out this week where actors speak to each other, essentially. And we had the iconic pairing of Cork's Killian Murphy and Margot Robbie. Obviously, Oppenheimer star, Killian Murphy, Barbie star, Margot Robbie. And Margot revealed in that interview that uh, a producer from Oppenheimer who she had actually worked with as well on The Suicide Squad, rang her basically to be like, because she was producing as well, rang her to be like, hey, um, we think, me and Chrissy Nolan here, we think you should actually move the date of the release of Barbie. We just, we think that's a, a good idea. And she said, okay, bet. If you're scared, <laughs> if you're scared, babes, you can move your date. You move the release date of Oppenheimer if you're that scared. And the producer was like, well, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that, but we really think you should. And then she was like, no, nah. <laughs> sorry. I believe, I believe in my gal. I believe in my gal, Barbie. I do not care about this atomic bomb, man. You could take your cork, white, cork, white walker looking man. you will be fine. It's Christopher Nolan. you will be fine. Uh, the producer was Charles Rovin. Uh, worked on the Suicide Squad and he's worked on loads of Christopher Nolan's movies before. I'm just, this, and this, I will say this interview is a really, 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 really good watch if you're someone who, I'm going to be honest, maybe underestimated Margot Robbie a little bit in terms of her acting prowess and commitment to her craft because hearing her speak about the physicality of acting and how seriously she takes acting and how much she struggled initially with the Barbie role and getting into the Barbie mindset and headspace. Um, And it's also really interesting insight into Greta Gerwig and how amazing Greta Gerwig is at assisting these actors and bringing references to them that maybe you wouldn't have thought of to help them get into the headspace of the characters they were playing. So brilliant, so good. And it's just worth it also to see Killian Murphy be like, no, I am aware of memes, babe. (laughs) I do know what a meme is. Oh, it's giving go watch a Star Wars. Um, okay, from Barbenheimer to, I mean, I don't know how to segue this, but I absolutely loved, 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 loved this chat. And I feel like this is going to awaken a lot of memories for people. Before Girls Aloud and One True Voice, there was Hearsay. A pop band mashed together on the competition reality TV show, Pop Stars. And while their initial success was gargantuan, the band were unable to maintain it. Joining me to discuss their early beginnings and the ultimate fate of the band is singer, podcaster and celebrant for Curtis. 
Ferg Curtis. You are so welcome to Flop Culture. How? Thank you so much. Are you doing? I am great. I'm so delighted to be here. I'm so excited to be with you in this stunning space. I know, it's very gorgeous. It is. To, props to Adam and the boys for yes. housing us gorgeously as always. Yeah, it's been a long time coming. I'm excited to have you on the couch. What are you talking about today? What's your flop? Oh, I'm so excited. Okay, so this is like throwback to my youth. Um, so we are talking about the original pop stars. Well, actually not the original pop stars, which I found out yesterday, but the original reality UK show pop stars and the band that came from it, the ever fantastic hearsay. I have vivid memories of hearsay and their debut single, Pure and Simple, obviously, yes. because on this iteration of pop stars, we watched them their journey to this single and inevitably finding out whether it would go to number one. I remember the video. I remember at least the look of all the band members. I'm going to be honest, did I remember all their names before today? No, but I know it now. Um, I have such vivid memories of fancying Noel as yes, a child. Yes. Noel Sullivan, shout out. Vanilla, I fancy him today. <laughs> I have just followed him on Instagram <laughs> this week. I was like, why do I not follow Noel Sullivan? <laughs> Devastated he's married. Yeah, I genuinely followed I him being like, this is it. <laughs> he's got to reach out. <laughs> I he's was like, delighted. where's all this interest coming from after this episode comes out? He's like, God, this I was like, this is why the universe hasn't sent me my man yet because Noel has just been waiting. But Truly, no, he's yeah. married. I mean, for now. Yeah. Or anyway. <laughs> we'll see. Just we'll see. Noel, if you're listening, just a coffee will open yeah. up the conversation. Yeah, you know? absolutely. For yeah. open to networking with yeah. you. Um, but I was less familiar with pop stars. Like I obviously, like yeah. I know it, but my memories of it weren't as strong and I found revisiting clips of it so funny as a reality TV format, as a reality TV competition format. What are your earliest memories of it? So it's funny because I was thinking about this during the week. After I said it to you, I was like, oh, this is going to be brilliant. And then I was like, wait, Fanula is possibly a strong 10 years younger than me like in and around. So I was like, this was before your time. Whereas for me, I think I was about 13, 14, budding pop star myself, you know, in my head, delusion and all that. And I was obsessed, like literally obsessed with this show. And I loved the whole format of getting to see behind the scenes. And back then, it was in the hotel rooms. It was in the like, you know, people lining up along the street. Like I I rewatched bits of it and they were like, 3,000 people showed up to audition for this show. And I was like, 3,000. That's not a lot, lads, for like today. But it was so raw. And I actually loved watching it back because I got like a little bit emotional watching some of it back because it was, they really had no idea mm. what they were taking on. They had no idea how big reality singing competitions were going to become. Um... And it was kind of amazing to watch really normal people go through the process of auditions. And when I was like 14, 15, not that I was auditioning for stuff that size, but in stage school, like I was auditioning for things, uh, musicals, Amdram stuff. So I was like, oh, I'm getting ready to go on Pop Stars. I'll be on Pop Stars too or something. So like I was obsessed. I was in the room practicing. They sang the same songs over and over again. That's what I found so interesting as well <laughs> in comparison to the likes of an X Factor which obviously came after where yeah. you have, you know, the fake setup of they come with a song they want to sing it, that doesn't go well so then Simon's like sing this other song and then it's all of a sudden amazing. You have these people being actively drilled singing My Heart Will Go On Don't Go Breaking My Heart over and like these various yeah. kind of shitty dance routines they're singing it to the judges then they're singing it down a lens then they're working on the harmonies like it is done with absolute, like a military regime. Like it's, which I kind of loved. It is very, it still had that rawness. As you said, you're in these kind of function rooms. One room at one point, I I think it was, again, one of Noel's auditions. And it looks like he's on the top of a cruise ship or something. Like it's bizarre. And then Mylene Class, who goes on to make the band Hearsay as well. She looks like she's in some room in an industrial estate. You know what I mean? Like it's just... I bring this back. Is I think this the campaign needs to start here to bring this, this iteration format. of this back. Yeah, because it's just look, and it wasn't perfect, which I'm sure we'll get into. It, and you yeah. kind of see the cracks of people having lots of things to say and generally not nice. 100%. And this is like peak tabloid culture and yeah. media and all that jazz. But it is so authentic, and you even see that with the confessionals and the talking heads that the the band members do. 
throughout yeah. the show. Like you get such a good insight into everything, how they're feeling, like they're getting annoyed about certain things being dragged out and there's such an honesty to it, I think. It's totally. brilliant. Such an honesty, particularly like I found with Kim Marsh, mm. who's on Carnation Street now, who probably is one of the bigger stars to come out of yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. Are any of them really stars? I would actually say probably Mylene Class is the only one who's made it, made it. Yeah. And is known by kind of everyone. But Kim is known on, she's done reality yeah, TV Yeah, she's show. definitely second, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But she was so, like, just herself. Mm. Like, warts and all, she had a temper. She was okay with showing it. She she was a real mammy, which she obviously was a mam when she was in the show, which was like a big controversy when she got into the band that then they found out she had kids. And yeah, she had like lied about it or not said it to them. She hadn't said it to them. So she had two kids and then she got in the band and they found out that she had two kids. And it was literally like, how how could she possibly be in a pop band and have two kids? It was this, I remember that controversy really strongly because she was, I think she was about 24 when she got into the band. Mm. She was definitely a good bit older than the rest of them. Um, 24, like a good bit older. She was still a baby. <laughs> but um, yeah, like it was this massive thing. But she just wore her heart on her sleeve and I loved watching it back and being like, God, I love Kim Marsh. And then I went down a little rabbit hole of watching her in Pop Stars to Opera Stars. I didn't really go and watch any Carnation Street clips or anything. Fair, yeah, yeah, fair. But I kind of was like, Kim Marsh is kind of iconic. She was really that like first reality TV show person who was like, here is me, authentic, raw. I just loved her. Mm. She was kind of, and she was tipped for the band day one. Yeah. Day one. Her and Noel, they built the band around them. I'm convinced of it. You don't think Mylene? No. 100% not. I don't think Mylene was meant to be in the band. (gasps) So here's my theory. So there was another one, uh, Jessica. Okay. uh, Who ended up in Liberty X. Yes. So her, Suzanne and my, uh, her, Kim and Mylene. No, I'm getting mixed up. Jessica, Kim, Suzanne throughout the show were always shown together. Mm. They were shown in the rooms practicing their harmonies. They were shown having the chats. They were shown gossiping about people. And they really, Jessica had a real storyline, like, and she was really in it. And then she did this press conference. Like, remember, I don't know if you saw, they had to do these fake press conferences. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she basically was like, yeah, I've smoked cannabis. And yeah, and they annihilated her. (laughs) They were like, what? You did what? No, the tabloids will tear you apart. And she could just, you could just see her like falling apart. She thought she was going to be kicked out. She wasn't. She made it to the top 10. But I think that's the reason she didn't get into the band. And I think she, her, uh, Kim and Suzanne were meant to be the three. And I think, and they even did it in the final. It was between Mylene, Jessica and Tony, who was going to be the last member of the band. And I was like, oh, that's clever producing. Because I think at the time, everyone would have been like, it's Jessica. Mm. Of course it's Jessica. And... Mylene was an interesting one now. Watching it back, I'm like, Mylene was there for business. She was, I was going to say this, she is to the T about everything in the confessionals. She is so confident in a way that's like, I do do not say it as a read. I'm just like, she's in there. She knows exactly what she was doing. She describes the day in minute detail and everything she had to do and what she was going to do to achieve it. Incredible, she was like so to the point, like they'd all be like, "This is my dream. I love to sing. Oh my god, my mom will be so proud if I make that." And Miley was like, "This is a job. This is an audition." She's like, "If I don't get this, I'm on to the next." I was like, "So I don't know if they necessarily want that energy, mm. but knowing like behind the scenes of auditions, I say she was super professional, like." that they were really able to work. And say she knew how to play the game. Yeah. And she knew how to work everyone. And when Jessica kind of dropped her cannabis bombshell, they were like, oh, <laughs> go for Mylene. She's professional. She'll yeah. keep them all together. And actually, I watched an interview with, they all call her Susie, but Suzanne, who's now in Emmerdale. I don't know if she's still in it. But I watched one and she kind of revealed what was going on behind the scenes of her, um, Hearsay. And she was like, they walked in, they were handed contracts, they signed away their lives, they didn't know what they were signing, except Mylene. Mylene was sitting in the room 
asking questions, being like, and what's this? And what's that? And the rest of them were just like, there's my signature, see you later. Yeah, great, great yeah. opportunity. So I think Mylene came into it and she was also, I've gone too, like, too deep dive, but Mylene... There is no such thing as too deep yeah, dive on this dream. podcast. She was booked for a tour, a UK and Ireland tour in some musical. She was already working as like a musical theatre singer, which I'm also like... I don't think she was the best singer. We'll get into the vocals of each one of them. But she was booked for a tour and then she got this and she says in an interview, my dad literally said to me, why are you giving up a year's work to go into a pop band? And she was like, it it really like shook me, but I'm glad I went with the decision because obviously she has had an incredible yeah. career. Yeah, for you sure. Know? For anyone who's, I, we've touched on a few elements of the show, but I suppose bring us through the format kind of from start to the final. We've gone through some people who ended up making the band. Yeah. But yeah, from kind of day one to day X with Davina, the live final. The live final. Insane. Bring us through and we'll talk about it. Okay, day one. So I think the first few episodes were basically the auditions. Mm. You had the people standing up in hotel rooms, lined up, the numbers on them, singing woefully. Mm. Like, there was very few singers who would be able to get on an X Factor stage today and, and even, I'd say, get past the ju- mm. the producers round. So first few episodes were all that and they were letting them through and it was really like the judges were in their faces. Talk to me about the judges then. Who are the so judges? So the judges are Nigel Lithgow. Could Nasty be saying Nigel. Yep. Nasty Nigel. Yep. And the original Nasty Judge. Nikki Chapman, who was like the P or her thing was she was a publicist for the Spice Girls. Yeah. And then Paul Adam was a record producer, yeah. executive, I think with Polydor Records, which yeah. were very big at the time. So they were the three judges, but the original judge was meant to be <gasps> Simon Cowell. <gasps> and he turned it down because he said, this show will never work. <gasps> there you go. There you go. So, and they were like, we want Simon Cowell. And after the ratings went incredible, he went off and did Pop Idol and now then went on his journey. Um, but he said, I watched an interview with Nikki Chapman and she was like, Simon really regrets that one. Yeah. I know he does. But they were the three judges right in the faces of all these like children. Yeah, like there's no table with the Spancon Coke glass or something. They're like standing around in a circle. Some of the, yeah. some of the auditionees are like singing kind of towards specific judges. There are a yeah. few like hilarious auditions where they're singing, like it's just, they're getting closer and closer to the judges and they're like, what the, it's so strange. With a whole room behind them. Yeah, everyone else is, all the other auditionees are waiting are and watching. There. Yeah, And you're like literally getting clapped by the other auditionees. Like it's, it's intimidating. Mm. Like I'd rather walk into a room with just four people. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of the first few episodes and then it moved on to boot camp and as you said earlier it was boot camp they worked them to the bone like they, now it's so funny because they're like we're going in to do our choreography and then they showed them it was a lot of bouncing yeah choreography the word is being used very loosely loosely and I never saw now from the clips I watched back I never saw a choreographer no so I don't know if someone was there I saw a vocal coach yeah um but yeah, there was a lot of bouncing and even when they got them up to do their dance uh, auditions, they literally were just like press play and they just jammed. Yeah. And Freestyle. Freestyle. And there was just, it was like, you're in the club, lads, let's see if you can move because all you need to do is a couple of bounces and yeah. a couple of little kicks and maybe a slide. Yeah. It's Mylene when they're at one point she's in doing, they're doing All Saints with a group of other yes, girls. Yes, I'm so glad and you she's brought like, this up. And she's like, oh my God, you know, she's talking about how sometimes, she was like, oh, it's a slower routine so I thought it'd be easier but like, with a slower routine sometimes you've more to think about whatever but then it cuts to her, like absolute comedy, it cuts to her like kind of doing, <laughs> never, ever, ever, like just kind of a snap and like a little bit of a sway. I'm like, girl, what are you talking about? Like, what are you actually talking it's about? It's barely there? movement. It's barely name. movement. But that performance, the one who was singing, I think her name was Sally, can't believe I remember that. But she was singing the lead and she forgot all her words. And she was kind of like, oh God. And she was trying to find them. And Mylene was beside giving her oohs and her ahs with the most confidence. And she was just like, see you later, Sally. I'm making the band. I'm leaving you in the dust. <laughs> yeah. And the judges said it. They're like, is Mylene a team player? And I think throughout the whole show, you kind of saw bits of Mylene is here to get the job and kickstart her glamorous career. Mm. Like she had it like day one. Mm. Um, but that was like boot camp. Loads of other bits about boot camp 
um, like Darius Dinesh. Like R.I.P. Just I know oh, it's really sad. So sad. But he was so iconic, and actually, I think he was just a bit ahead of his time. I think so. Yeah. You know, watching it back, he genuinely was just like, "Ads, I love you all." Like, do you feel the energy in the room? And they were all like, "Energy." What should you want about? He would thrive. And today. now the girlies love energy. L- love energy. They're living off energy. He, he'd be in the band. They'd Truly. be like, get the one about energy in yeah. the band. <laughs> get the one about there energy. There was another girl called Claire who was kind of like put forward as the bigger girl. Yeah, that's one of the, where it was like, product of its time, still not in, not condoning it, still not great, but it's like, oh yeah, this was... This she was, was still a reality yeah. talent show at this time of year. You can, she even says in her piece to camera, and I think she's got it. She's like, the look of a skinny gills or whatever. That was a terrible accent. She's oh my not God. She's like, big. But she's not, it's, but she says it herself and she, I know. that they like, you know, they had such an idea of what they wanted the band to be. Yeah. And she was never going to fit it, even though she was so good. Yeah. And it's just, because she, she was a good singer. Yeah. I remember so her singing good. Reach from By Ask Club Seven. Yeah. And they were like, great singer. And even, I remember, like, looking back on it, you're like, oh, that wouldn't pass today. But when she did the freestyle dancing, mm. they were like, look at her loving her life. Yeah. She's great giving it socks. Oh, yeah, there's a, Nikki Chapman has a line as well where it's, she, she's doing one audition at some point and it's like, I wonder, is she, I'm heavily paraphrasing her, but she's like, oh, she obviously doesn't look anything like the rest of the girls in the room. I wonder, is that affecting her? I'm like, shut up. Shut up, yeah. Nikki Chapman. Would you shut up? But there up? was a lot of that. Yeah. Which I think we'll get to later in the later episodes. Mm. One massive controversy with Nigel and Kim. Okay. Have you seen that? It's ringing a faraway bell, but I okay. don't think I got back to it in terms of my research. So I'll I'm... go through the, the rest of the show. Boot Camp was about three episodes and then they were down to the final ten. Mm. It was a quick show. It was 13 episodes. It was like, you know, we're not messing around because I don't think they knew if it would work. Mm. And then the top 10 happened. Like some of the episodes were two hours long. It's insane. It, you were giving up your Saturday nights. Like, yeah. yeah. Which I happily Which you did. Did yeah. happily. Um, and then the last episode before the live was them all finding out the old school, going to the houses, traveling around, sitting with the family, which I watched this morning. Um, I was like, I better, because there's actually a two hour recap. Mm. And I was looking after my niece the other day and I was like, put her on my chest. We're watching pop stars. Let me remind myself. But I didn't <laughs> get through it educated all. educated child. Yeah, exactly. We're going to do your pop star history now. Um, but yeah, I watched it this morning and I was like, this is really, like it was really emotional. Mm. You could, because they were so honest. Like there was one girl, Kelly, who ended up in Liberty X and like Nikki told her you didn't make, like there was no, they were trying to pull it out. They were trying to do the thing of, and you know, everyone's worked really hard. Suzanne even said this when uh, Nick went to her, or not Nick, uh, no, when Paul. Nigel went to Nigel, her, her right. gaff and he's like, you split the judges, two yeah. of them, two of them are for you, one was against you and he's, and Suzanne's like, Suzanne thinks she hasn't gotten it at this point. Yeah. So she's like, and I was just sitting there and I was like, would this man ever hurry on? Like, because he's just actively like, stretch this out, stretch this out, stretch this out. Let's get the best reaction. It's. But I felt like they didn't do it as much as they would do it these days. Like with the Nicole Scherzinger and Rylan thing where she really drew it out. But it was the early stages of them kind of having a banter Mm. with the contestants, but they didn't do it to the contestants who didn't get in. Mm. And your one Kelly, like Nikki just said, listen, you didn't make the band. And she was like, oh, okay. And she was so shut down. And she was so, and your one was like, any questions? No, 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 I don't think so. And it could have come across a little bit, like from someone who's done loads of auditions, you're learned to be like, thank you so much for the opportunity. Like you're taught that. She was shut down. Yeah. And I was kind of like, oh, this is a bit awkward. Like, come on, Kelly, give us something. Yeah. Nikki left and she like broke down. And I was like, oh, this is... I was genuinely crying with some of them. Yeah. You know, I was like, this is actually how it should be. Like, this was really their dreams. They yeah. had been like put through their paces and worked. And even Michelle, do you remember Michelle Heaton? Yes. Michelle yeah. Heaton, who actually was a gorgeous singer. Yeah. They sh- showed a few clips of her. Um, well, we will get to it, obviously, but Liberty X kind of at the last laugh well, then. You know yes, what I mean? True. You know what I mean? But they, Michelle, when they said it to her, um, oh, you didn't make the band. And they're like, keep going, you're really good. And she's like, I don't have the energy. She's like, I can't put myself through something like that again. Like they were push through it. They were all sick the whole time. But it's that honesty as well you'd never get at the end of a, you know, like never. an X Factor judges houses. Again, just to use that example where they're like, obviously they'll say, you know, I'm devastated. I really thought I made it. But you'll never get a conversation where there's an acknowledgement of the work that's been put in, the time 
the effort, the energy, as you yeah. said, the actual seeing them being sick. I suppose you kind of did see it in the middle of like X Factor with the likes of Diana Vickers. I don't know if you watched that season when she yes. got really sick and she couldn't meet, meet Mariah Carey and they had to film Mariah Carey pretending like she gave a fuck about Diana Vickers. It was very funny. Maybe she did. I don't know. Sorry, maybe. <laughs> um, but even that was just kind of like, it was never addressed as like, oh, because she's working so hard. It was just like, she got tonsillitis, shit one, lol. You, do you get what I mean? Yeah. Like it was just... To have that curtain, I'm not. They didn't pull the curtain back fully, but to even get that kind of acknowledgement of this was such a strenuous process for people who were in their late teens, early twenties. Like I think the youngest was Suzanne. Yeah, she was eighteen, and then Kim was twenty four, and the rest of them fell in the middle. Eighteen, a child, a, a child. child. Like now she didn't look like a child. That haircut. I'm glad they popped the stenos in. Yeah, if, you know, because the hairstyle was very, <laughs> like. I don't know, old lady Bob. It was giving, yeah. It was interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, they were so young and like they were sick all the time. Every clip I watched, they're like, I'm dying of this. I'm dying of this. But there was no like, there was no Diana Vickers take the week off. There was like, this is what the industry is about. You get up there and you sing. And they had to sing warts and all. And mm. some of the singing was shocking. <laughs> Well, Shocking. let's talk about, okay, so the five that made it, yeah. we have Danny Foster, we've mentioned loads of them already, but Danny Foster, Mylene Class, Kim Marsh, Suzanne Shaw, and Noel Sullivan. Who, okay, who could sing and who couldn't? And you're qualified in, to say this because in, you are literally a professional singer. In my opinion, looking back on it, and it was a different time, so the level of skill you needed back then wasn't maybe as much because singing has come on so much. I think the band was built around... Kim Marsh and Noel Sullivan because they were the best singers. Okay. I think they genuinely had really strong voices. They probably, well, Noel is a West End singer now um, and has done massive roles. I've seen him in a couple of things and he's he's brilliant. Mm. Um, and I say Kim is still really good. Mylene, I didn't see, I'm not saying she can't sing. Mm. I didn't see a lot of it in the programme. I know she was an exceptional musician. Like she played every instrument under the sun and she even had a piano album come out like years after mm. Hearsay. I don't know if I could say, there was a lot of, she could sing in tune. Yeah. But whether the voice was like, you know, gorgeous or beautiful, I don't know. Sorry, Mylene. I know you're listening. <laughs> um, Danny, Yeah. <laughs> I think I Look, feel really bad. I think there's bad. an element of it, 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 there needed to be they had an idea that it was three girls two boys. Totally. You know? And, and I fulfilled. think they loved Danny like watching the show they were like Danny's always smiling he's a little cheeky chappy he's like he's a gorgeous I think they all loved him and even when you saw them get into the band which actually I have something to say about Mylene for that or not get into the band get into the top ten you could see they were like they kind of treated him like a little brother. Yeah. And I think the judges loved him. Everyone in the room loved him. He was a, an okay singer. Mm. You know, he was grand. He auditioned for The Voice years later. Yes, I saw yeah. that. Yeah, guys. And he didn't get through. He did a weird rendition of a Spice Girls song, I think, and no one Something turned around. Something like that. Yeah, I can't remember. But I think, I don't know what Danny Foster's doing now. I could tell you one He's thing. Re- about- oh, I looked it up. He's oh, very into um, meditation, which is great. And, oh, I love that. Um, low profile, married someone called Victoria Goddard. Great. Good for him. Good for him. Yeah, absolutely. We love meditation and we love marriage. Very handsome. Yeah. Um, grand singer, but seemed like everyone loved him. Yeah. Um, Suzanne. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Again, I think they just needed a blonde girly. But you can you even think? you can even see that from the audition process. Again, where she's doing fucking. Can, can I also say is "Reach for the Stars" not a very strange audition song? Was it just because it was S Club and totally. it was that time? It must have been a big song at the time. You know what I mean? Like you're not exactly showing your vocal prowess on that. No, no, no. I say no, with absolutely no vocal experience. But it's an Ohio song. Yeah. You're you're one who basically sang S Club Seven. Joe was a she had a good yeah. range. But the the audition of her singing, I, I genuinely don't know why she made the band and I feel really bad saying that because I actually like her in interviews and like she comes across really nice and it seems like they got on well with her. But I was like, the singing. And they kept saying it. They're like, your singing's very weak. And I'm like, why is she getting through then? Yeah. 
You know, even like hearing Michelle Heaton singing it, I'd say she was stronger. Your one Jessica was stronger. But at the time, it wasn't about vocals. Mm. It was about the band. Yeah. It was about well, putting the as band I say, together. As I said, I think they had a vision of what it looked like. And it was just like, we have enough in the strong vocalists, Kim and Noel, Kim and, and Noel. everyone else. It's fine. They can and orbit when, and work together and totally. they'll be anchors. The, we have the vision. Perfect. Totally. And when you go to the album, which we'll talk a little bit about, when anyone else sings a solo line, Noel and Kim are dubbed on top of them. In the majority of it. Oh They'll always God. be doing some sort of ad lib above them or a little harmony line. The other three, Danny got a good few solos. Rare that Suzanne got to sing on her Didn't own. Didn't get a look in. Well, she did, but like Kim was supporting her from... From behind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And kind of similar with Mylene. Yeah. Now, I don't think Mylene cared because Mylene had a bigger plan. Yeah. Her, you know, but it was interesting when they made the top 10... I watched it and I literally rewound it a couple of times. When they got in, they all ran to hug each other. No one ran to hug Mylene. Oh, but and that's interesting like, because Mylene within the band, we kind of, we follow the rest of their journey yeah. and they're they're dogged by these rumours that Kim and Mylene don't get on. I'd believe it. Yeah. I actually, I'll take it as a fact. Now, today. I think they've made up since. Yeah, I watched an interview with Mylene last night on Jonathan was it Jonathan Ross I think and she's actually Suzanne's um, daughter's or son's godmother there you go and he was like do you stay in touch with everyone and she gave the very diplomatic answer of me and Suzanne are re- me and Susie are really close I'm her child's godmother and the others like I see them around and it's great when I see them so I don't think they're definitely not busy mates, but I think not. it's there's an acknowledgement that we all went through something and we all. But even Kim has been like, uh, and I well, this was even in the Talking Head kind of. It must have been like on the DVD going yeah. on the clip that I watched on YouTube, like kind of after the fact and kind of where it's recapping the full journey to the end or whatever, and you have that a clip of. Kim going mad at some, I think going mad at Mylene because Mylene must have said something about her or referred to her being stupid or something. And, oh, I didn't see that. Uh, Kim's going mad. I'm sure if you look into it, there is more context that I'm not providing here, unfortunately. But Kim kind of acknowledges that like, look, yeah, I'd never say the things I said then now. And like, I was a bit hot-headed and stuff like that. But again, it was just like the process and it was quite stressful and we were all putting house to live together and it was like nothing we'd ever done before. So, mm. Yeah. It was, yeah, I don't think they would have got on and, or they did get on. But they were both strong personalities. Mm. Like, this is where we should bring up the Kim and Nigel fight. Yes. So in those after the scene stuff, Nigel basically came into a room. They were all sitting around. Kim was lying on the couch, always in a Manchester United jersey. Constantly. Slay. Yeah, I loved it. Um, And he basically was like, you're fat, lose weight. I do remember this now, yeah. Well, I remember the the furor around, I don't remember the scene or whatever. But I yeah. remember it being like a massive thing because she really stood up for herself. She was like, that is out of order. She's mm. like, you can't say that. And she was really upset. And actually she came out later, years later and was like, I had an eating disorder at the time. So it was like, it was really layered. And again, there kind of is just no excuse for it. I know it was kind of of the time that people threw those comments around. But even in the moment, you could see everyone in the room was really shocked. Mm. And she was... Miniature. Yeah. She was tiny. Which is the thing, like it's... That's, yeah. Like it's... But like she has actually done interviews on that since and been like, oh, there's no hard feelings. He was doing his job. He literally was making a TV show mm. and that was going to get controversy. So I feel like she kind of had tough enough skin um, to move on from it, but it was awful watch. Yeah. Imagine you didn't though. Imagine you were a contestant that was way more Well, I wonder if he said it to someone like, like Suzanne who seemed a little bit more vulnerable. Mm. Um, and even in the interview I watched with her, which is a really interesting podcast, because um, they don't have massive profiles. No. Um, so there's not a lot of interviews where they really go into it. But in this interview, she went into the breakdown of hearsay and you could tell she was really vulnerable at the time. She didn't really know what was going, going on. Yeah. Like she was 18. So young. So yeah, when they young. split up, which we'll get into. She was only 21. Like it's, it was 21. so, it ended as quickly as it happened, you know? So I think less than two years, was it? Yeah. She crazy. entered at 18, was in the band by 19. And yeah, they were done by 21. 
So the final of the show is them waiting to see if Pure and Simple went to number one, their first yeah. single. And it's live, interspersed with like like pre-recorded clips, obviously, yeah. of them doing other bits or whatever. And it's in, it's so, Davina McCall is hosting it. It's in someone's living room for some, I'm not even sure <laughs> yes, who. And, and you have a countdown on the screen that's like eight seconds to, or to eight minutes to we find out who's number one, whatever. And Davina's like turning off the radio so they don't hear. And like, then you get the live chart announcement and everyone's like screaming. Wait, sold just under 550,000 copies, which is like, unheard of now in the stream age like yeah. they were immediately the biggest thing like people really just got on board with them why Why do you think that was like I do, I do think the song is good but was it also just I was wondering if we were going to fight about that oh really yeah because like I've, I was messaging some of my friends on the way and being like I'm going off to talk about hearsay for an hour and all of them like not all of them there was like a couple of them and they were like hearsay oh do they sing pure and simple that was an awful song no incorrect I totally agree. A good song. Good song. A good song. A great debut single. Great debut single. I'm not hugely familiar with the music beyond that, but I think it set them up as best as they could, I think. At at that time. At that time. Yeah. It's very 2000s. Like, it's very that time. I think everyone's kind of doing their best, getting their kind of best moment the video is kind of iconic in a way, the even though it's video, so simple. With the fire behind it. Yeah, them. no Brilliant. pun intended, but... Yeah. I think it was the last... So if you listen through the album, so I was like, when am I going to listen to this album? So I listened to it on my run on Saturday. And you get your pure and simple at the start, mm-hmm. great, you're bouncing along. The second song, I forget the name of it. I uh, have it written down here. There's a lot of covers on it. So they have like covers. covers of Monday, Monday by Monday, the Mamas and Monday. Papas, Bridge Over Troubled Waters, yeah. which is just one that the everyone has to do. The Way to Your Love was their other big one. Okay. Um, and then after that, it kind of is like a replica of different like pop songs. Yeah. Like it's very, there's a lot of times I was listening to it and I was like, this is very five, very Atomic Kitten at times. Uh, there's one track on it that's very... Like the instrumental is very superstitious, Stevie Wonder. The vocals are not, but... (laughs) The vocals are not. So after the first two tracks, you're kind of like, oh, it's kind of gets a bit samey. Like I could be listening to any pop band. Yeah. Well, that's what I think. Obviously, they're into personal issues and we'll get on to what happens after this. But I also just don't... As much as I think Pure and Simple is a good like indicator of who... They, they were. were and what maybe we could expect. I think then the difficulty is when you're doing a lot of covers and stuff like that, there is still no identity for the band going forward. Other than that, it's like a manufactured pop band, which I know was the point of the show and they achieved it. But then it's like, OK, what now? What How do we, do we continue to sustain this? Yeah. Yeah. I Yeah, maybe they shouldn't have put the covers because Monday, Monday and Bridge Over Troubled Water Waters were the two songs that on the show it was like, go... Go. They sang it every episode mm. again and again. Do your harmonies, change the harmonies. You go on this harmony, you go into that band. Like, so I say by the time it came to record the single, they were probably like, listen, we know those songs back to forth. Can we just throw them on the album? Yeah. Inside but out. maybe they shouldn't have. Mm. Um, but I think, I do think Pure and Simple and The Way to Your Love are two really good pop songs. But my theory is, I think they were the last of that era. And they actually like all the pop bands kind of, I don't know, was there much more pop bands after that? No, we kind of go into a little bit of a drought until Girls Aloud, which would have been mid to late. Yeah, Yeah, you're talking at least. But they had a cooler energy, a cooler vibe. Like this was pure pop music, like what the Spice Girls were doing, Boys Own, Five. But they weren't, like they were so sexless in a way that it was like totally. marketed to children kind of in the way that S Club were. You know what I mean? Yes. You, know what I mean? you know what I mean? But it was like S Club were like really colourful and like they're driving around and now they're in the snow and stuff like that. And it's all party, party, party. Whereas like they were kind of like, I don't know, it was much more muted, much more contemporary adult kind of vibe. But it was I think so... they were trying to play both. They were mm. trying to be like, we're going to go in, even in one of the interviews I listened, they're like, our third album, which never came out, is a lot cooler. It's a lot, you know, um, more mature. And I was like, was it though? Because the second album, I tried listening to it and I'm sorry. 
They had one good song, Everybody. I actually think it was a bit of a banger. But I think it, that time had been and gone. That mm. kind of pop era had been and gone. Yeah. And they needed to move on and find... And I just don't think with the way they were set up, they actually fit any kind of more contemporary vibe. Yeah. So that first album was called Pop Stars, sold yeah. over 300k copies. Um, they were kind of straight out touring. Um, they initially announced five dates, added 30 more dates. The new dates, I think, kind of struggled to sell which I kind of, maybe the writing was on the wall there. I'm not sure. But then you have this like live DVD. Nine months after they released their debut album, they're in recording. Everybody, as you mentioned, yeah. um, and then it's released. And as you said, single of the same name, debuted at number four. The album only went to number 24, which is insane, given pop stars went to number one. Yeah. Like went on to sell just one fifth as many copies as pop stars. It's funny because like, I know at the time it was like, I remember even... Pop stars, the rivals with Girls Aloud and One Day More. No, that's a one true voice song. One true voice. Da, 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 the sacred the trust in me. There you go. They were all about the number one. But when you think about it, going in at number twenty-four, I think that's pretty good. It's very good by like today's standards. But then I like. Were they ever... Well, was you were ever a failure any... if you went in at 24. Yeah. They... I, ju- there, I just felt like there was no long-term plan. And because they were so successful yeah. at first, it was like, well, you literally need to do it again. There's no number after number one. You're number one or you're nothing. Like, you there's know? There's only one way down. I think Danny said that in one of the episodes. He's like, there's only one way down. Maybe he manifested their downfall for them. Maybe, yeah. You know, so then... They did everything. Like, they literally... They did one year. I know they lasted just under two years. But in one year... They did the two albums. They did the massive tour. They obviously did the show. They did the Brits, Top of the Pops. Like, they literally were like, let's stick a whole pop career in this one year. They were probably absolutely burnt out by the end of it. Mm. And then they're like, all right, let's go. And then Kim left. Which and then will, Kim left, mm. yeah. So she had just started a relationship with former EastEnders actor Jack Ryder. Yes. She was also putting it down to, and I think the media narrative was that she was feuding with Eileen Class, um, a rep for Hearsay to come out and deny the reports. Everybody who's involved with Hearsay will be sitting down this week to discuss the future. Kim Marsh is still with the band, um, but then Kim announced separately that she was leaving Hearsay. And I think if we're on about the same podcast, Susie talks about it on that podcast, yes. where it was basically like, Kim would say herself, the communication wasn't there. We all learned yeah. she was leaving, leaving through the media, which never a great start, really. So then they started auditioning other people, but instead of like having to replace Kim, but instead of it being like its own show, it was like segments on this morning. But Sorry, it was, I did not know this. Neither did I. It was only when I dug into this. So, and then the person that replaced Kim was someone called Johnny, Johnny Chantal, who yeah. was married to Lisa Scott Lee. He won the auditions, but then there was a lot of controversy because he'd been in a group himself Boom. that didn't last that long, had been a backup dancer for Hearsay at one point. Um, but that was like, that was February 2002. March 2002, I think there's a plan to go on an arena tour. That's cancelled to allow Chantal time to settle into the group, which is code for the tickets to not sell girls. There were yeah. no bums on seats, girls. Um, started recording their third album as the summer of uh, 2002. They, but they were then met with this constant abuse, they said. They'd be doing like radio, you know, like radio station circuits, whatever, to promote themselves. And they said it was just this insane animosity towards them. And I do okay. wonder why that was. I don't know if you can remit. Was it just the media narrative about Mylene and Kim? Was it the fact that they had failed, in inverted commas, with the second album and not done as well? The, to see the turn on them is kind of it, well, I crazy. Actually, like they had to cut that radio tour or there was a performance in Brighton, sorry, that they had to cut short because people were being so insanely negative and horrible towards them yeah. publicly. I actually, I don't remember that. And actually, I don't really remember their downfall. I do remember Kim leaving, but only by going back to it did I remember about your man Johnny joining. Mm. And that was very short-lived. Um... I kind of remember the hype and I did think they lasted longer than two years. Not even two years. Mm. Um, So I don't really remember the downfall. What I would say is maybe they were the gold, like they were the golden kids of the UK for a good year. They did everything. Like everyone, their dreams, oh, this is so cheesy. Their dreams are our dreams. We were like 
with them from day one. Mm. So I suppose when things start coming out, like Mylene and Kim are fighting, Kim leaves the band, and it's kind of like, oh, actually, they're not telling us a lot here. So maybe people got their backs against the wall and they're like, I'm not really into hearsay anymore. Yeah. Does it kind of undermine the experiment that was being undergone? With Kim leaving, it was like, okay, well, they couldn't keep it together. You know what I mean? They didn't put together this. How could they ever, when at the end of the day, again, they're very young, young, young humans, hard words to say, put together immediately, extremely, extremely, extremely famous. Like it was yeah. never, obviously could things have gone better? Yeah, but like it was always going to be difficult. But I think there was a lack of understanding on the public's behalf of that. So then to yeah. see Kim leave, other oh, fighting, they're going to look at pop stars and be like, well, it didn't work because they didn't put together this band that loved each other and made mm. really great music, successful music, you know? I think... I actually, I do kind of disagree because I think all pop bands were made like this. Okay. This was just documented. Mm. So I think it was more the level of success that they experienced so fast. And in that interview that we've talked about where we've seemingly gotten all our information. I link it in the notes. It is a good interview. It's a good interview. Um, In that interview, Susie is kind of like their phones were hacked. They didn't trust each yes, other. That was insane. Well, like it's not insane because like it was so off the time and yeah. it happened to so many people. But it's just it I can't like even they fathom were being that pitted against each yeah. other. You know. So actually, I'm not surprised that they broke down because it's kind of like they. Were, I think they probably wanted people fighting for the for the tabloids and stuff. Um, but I think forming the band like that, I think that was actually quite common. Mm. Uh, it's just that it was. Yeah, documented. And I think the downfall was the fact that they were pitted against each other. And I'm going to say it, I don't think they chose the right band. I wonder if Jessica was in there, would it be a different situation? Sliding doors. Yeah. And I feel like I actually really like Mylene Class. Mm. I'm a bit, I'm a big fan. I think what she does is amazing. I think she's a brilliant um, presenter and obviously she was on I'm a Celeb and she did She's a great celebrity. She's brilliant. Yeah. And she's, yeah, she's brilliant. Like, absolutely love her. Um, but at the time, I think, was she there for the band or was she there for herself? I don't know. Mm. Call in, Mylene. Yeah, Let us know. please call in. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, they did go on then until October 2002. They had one more album and that was their only one with Chantal and the lead single off that was called Loving Is Easy. A bit yeah. more of a sophisticated sound. Their lowest charting single to, get, to date, but it still peaked at number six, which again, very good. But apparently Polydor were like, we want this to get to at least number five. Otherwise, this is a catastrophic failure. Um, and then they were dropped, unfortunately. So, or oh, sorry, so there, was no, there was no album. It was just that single. Yeah, because she, Susie, I, lo- I love that we're calling her Susie as if we're best mates with her. We are, yeah. We are. Again, Susie, call in. Yeah. Please do. We'll get a coffee. Um, she kind of said that they had this album ready to go and it was a much more sophisticated sound. I think that is that is how she put it. But it just never came out. Mm. And I was listening to the interview and I was like, put it out now. Release the, songs the are sitting somewhere. Hearsay, hearsay's yeah. version. Yeah. Do you know they did a second version of Pure and Simple on the second album? I didn't know that. Yeah, they did an updated version. It's not as good. It's practically the same <laughs> they, song. They did an updated version. Not as good. It's ju- it's just the same song with like, they've changed the mix or something. Or yeah. Adam can help us out with this terminology. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they've like, it's not as good. It, okay. But I was like, why are you putting your first single on the second on album? the second like, album. There was a lot of clutching at straws. I think, but again, I'd love to know what was going on behind the scenes in the boardrooms with the people who actually had power. You know what I mean? Because totally. that's where those stupid decisions are being made where it's like, which we'll just put the single on the second album again. And people are like, what? Like even saying that now, how stupid is in- that? You, unheard of. Unheard of. Unheard of. Especially if it's an absolute banger. Yeah. And the second album, like, and as we said, the, sec- the first and second album came very close together. Mm. So there was just no point for it. Yeah. You know, I would love to, I wish there was more... Like, they'll never reunite. No. But I would almost like an interview with the five of them. But I don't know if... I could see them doing that. I def- There's never, we're never, ever, 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 ever getting a hearsay, like, musical reunion that is so far in the past for all of them. Which I think, again, probably rightly so, because, like... I'm okay with that, actually. Unless you were doing, I don't know, so a few little fun gigs or whatever. But, like, in terms of new music and stuff, we may sack that off, girls, you know? I genuinely... New music, no, thank you. Yeah, we'll absolutely just get, not. We'll get... 
pure and simple again. We'll just play that. You know? Instead of writing or recording new music, <laughs> we'll actually just get Spotify and we'll just play the song. Perfect. They'll literally Brilliant. be like, new song. Da, 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 and like change the mix again. <laughs> no. But I would love them to, I'd love to see how they'd interact with each other because actually watching their, now I'm very sorry Danny, I didn't deep dive you. Um, but the other four, I did go and like, check their Instagrams and check what they're up to and, you know, and they do kind of seem like really sound people mm. and really kind of like, they've really grown into themselves and they seem like they're in feels and obviously Danny is now that they're really happy in. So I'd wonder if you sat them all down, like, because they're all in their for- 40s, mm. like what they'd be like, you know, and even they're so young still. Yeah, just to be able to reflect on the experience and what they know now as well. But also talk about what was going on. The yeah. Because I feel like they could talk about it now and be like, listen, we were young, but yeah, me and Kim were fighting or yeah. me and Eileen were fighting. And give us that. Yeah. I think we deserve to know that. No, we absolutely do. Let's, hopefully this is us manifesting it. <laughs> um, before I let you go for yes. your bottom line, why do you think ultimately that hearsay flopped? I want to give a funny answer, but I can't. I'm going to give a very serious answer. That's I'm all for the serious answer. Communication. Lads, the communication. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Was not right. Mm. And I don't know, I think I need to reflect on this more, but did they choose the right people for the band? Because we didn't talk about Liberty X. We didn't talk about Liberty X. Sorry, very quickly, let's talk about Liberty X. Throw them in quickly. Like, they had their one iconic Song. I don't know any of their other songs. I do think they had a few more songs, but again, I'm not hugely familiar with them. But no. they, it, but again, when you compare them to Hearsay, they and they were, were just, they were just, pardon the pun, sexy, and the leathers <laughs> and the sticks, and it was just immediately like you knew what they were about. It was like gritty yeah. pop. Yes, you know, which was of the time. Actually, Liberty X were. Um, here says downfall because they came out and they're like lads this is what you should be doing mm. this is of the time and they were still doing their their slow choreo yeah you know Please don't take, and it's funny because uh, that song is a cover as well which I think people some Stop, people might not know yeah. yeah I can't remember who did it but yeah cover oh my god gas didn't yeah. know that yeah Adam's going to find out perfect and we'll yeah we definitely need to know that say it in here or add it in here um, you're more than welcome to come back and do an episode of Bop Culture on Liberty X Maybe we should do that. Maybe we should do that. Because that song like genuinely was iconic. And now going back to your final question, the downfall of Hearsay was communication, not picking the right band and Liberty X coming out and showing them how they're actually meant to do it. Mm. That's, but I really like Hearsay. I don't feel like that has come across. I feel like I've come in here and slated them a bit. But I I genuinely... Firm but fair, I think, Ferg. Yeah, and I still really, I really, really... Obviously, we're all really good friends. I really like them as people, you know. Um, and it was a massive time for me, like as a 14-year-old queer kid who dreamed of being a pop star and somehow ended up in opera. You know, that was like, it was massive. Mm. And it set off all the reality TV. The blueprint. You know? the but blueprint. I'd love to come back and do some bop culture on our Liberty X and You're find out more about Jessica and the cannabis. Yes, Absolutely. That's real investigative journalism right there. And I'm happy to be on board with you to do it. <laughs> Ferg, it's been a pleasure. Where can people find you, hear you, see you? So people can find me at Ferg C, um, F E A or G H. We're very precious about the A and the H. Um, C. And you can hear me on Let's Talk About the Arts, a new series coming out and Reimagining Ceremonies, which is my podcast with the gorgeous Karen Dempsey. And I have a cabaret night on the 3rd of December. I don't know when this is going out, so it might have already been. But you can see me in a cabaret night upcoming in the next while with the most incredible cast. And Fanula, one of the most iconic moments this year was Fanula rapping Lady Marmalade. Insane. Yeah. One of the highlights of the year. A hundred percent for me, absolutely personal, iconic personal achievement. For I me don't as care well. if, if nobody else enjoyed it. I don't care. I, did, I think so. everyone enjoyed it, particularly with the outfit. Oh, it was iconic. It was stunning. I'll dig out the footage for yeah. the social post for this. Until next time, Ferg. Thank you so much for joining me on Pop Culture. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ferg. I will leave all of his links below to his many, many podcasts. A great guy. Go check him out. Can't wait to have him back. He has loads of ideas for flops. He's a big 
big bag of flaps similar to Santa, so he will be back for another episode at some point. But loved chatting to him about hearsay and pop stars. Finally, top of the flaps. You're a flop. Flop, 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 flop. Top of the flaps this week is King Charles. Not for all the usual reasons, colonizing, all that jazz. Um, just kind of for being an idiot, to be honest. I mean, this man is running. Well, he's not really running a country, but you know what I mean? He's head of a country and he's going out with shit like this. Basically, Natalie Portman is currently promoting her new drama, May, December, which I think is coming to now or Sky for us. It's on Netflix in the States, but it's coming to now or Sky at some point over here very soon. Getting a lot of buzz. I'm very excited to watch it. She's promoting that. She was on Watch What Happens Live. And she was talking about Star Wars and the fact that she's very open to coming back to play Padme on screen again, should the occasion ever arise. She was very young when she got the role in the prequel trilogy. Um, like literally a teenager was 18 years old when The Phantom Menace uh, opened and went to cinemas. So Andy Cohen, he knew what he was doing here. Andy Cohen asks her what it was like to meet the British royal family at the Phantom Menace, Phantom, Phantom Menace, Phantom, Menace, Phantom Menace premiere, started a podcast. They said, all this podcast has done is show me that I cannot speak for a living, which is good. Phantom Menace. And she talks about meeting he was Prince Charles at the time. So she refers to him as Prince Charles, right? We're not going to get bogged down on maybe giving people the wrong royal titles, okay? Because quite frankly, who cares? But she said, I remember Prince Charles. He was then Prince Charles. She did correct herself in fairness. Uh, I remember Prince Charles asked me if I was in the originals, as in the original, the original Star Wars movies, right? The original Star Wars movies. I was like, no, I'm 18. But he was very friendly. Like... Is this your, is this your king? Is this your literal king, Charles? What? How? I don't understand how you can literally be sitting on millions of pounds worth of like jewels and shit and art that you robbed off other people and you can't pay someone to just actually, to make you say correct things. Again, ironic given I've just said loads of words incorrectly, but I digress. We won't get into that. <sighs> Silly, like. The original Star Wars came out in fucking 1900 and frozen to death. Dumb. Anyway. Flop behaviour, as per usual. Are we surprised? We're not surprised, girls. Anyway, I should say as well, if you're listening on Spotify, it gives you the option. There's a question as part of the episode where you can suggest who or what is top of the flops. And I'm always interested to see those. I haven't checked in a while. So if you have any suggestions for this week, let me know. And maybe I can talk about them on next week's episode. I am back next week with a brand new episode of Flop Culture. And I'm like deliriously excited about this one because it's potentially one of my favorite things I've ever watched, even outside the confines of this podcast. It's one of the, my favorite things that I've watched this year. It is a TV reboot gone far too soon. I'm furious furious about it but I missed all the petitions because I didn't watch it when it came out hopefully that's enough hints for you very excited for you to hear that this has been Flat Culture as always editor is Adam Shanahan I will see you next week bye bye